the sacred Triduum. It's one liturgy. Tonight you'll notice there is no ending of this Mass. Tomorrow, if you're here or if you watch during live stream, you'll notice that there's no beginning to tomorrow's liturgy, nor is there an ending tomorrow. And on Saturday, on Easter Vigil, there's no beginning. The church really shines in this liturgy, this one liturgy, the sacred Triduum. And at this liturgy tonight, Holy Thursday, the church commemorates the institution of the priesthood and the institution of the Eucharist. And in highlighting the Eucharist, three things. The power of the Lamb, the memorial sacrifice, and a suggestion for us to do. So first, the power of the Lamb. The church gives us, as, we, as I mentioned, commemorate the institution of the priesthood and the institution of the Eucharist. Our first reading is taken from Exodus chapter 12. The first reading is the famous passage, the Passover. The Passover being the central point of the Old Testament. The Passover being the central point in the lives of our Jewish brothers and sisters even today. At this point here in Exodus chapter 12, God has called Pharaoh to release the Israelites. The Israelites who have been enslaved for 430 years, trapped. Telling Pharaoh to release them, Pharaoh who's a tyrant, and of course, through miraculous feats of the plagues, Pharaoh does not let them go. So tonight, we hear about the final blow. And in verse 12, we read this. God speaking to the Israelites, saying, I will go through Egypt, striking down every firstborn in the land, human being and beast alike, and executing judgment on all the gods of Egypt. In verse 23, we don't hear this in our reading today, but a few verses from where our reading leaves off. Verse 23 describes this as the destroyer. And I think of back to the old, which is still plays, or at least when I was growing up, I remember watching Charleston Heston's Ten Commandments. They'd always played around this time every year. Back then it was on ABC, I remember. And I remember always at this time, it was real dark and gloomy. It was a kind of this scary scene and had this green, eerie fog representative of the destroyer, the judgment coming down, going through the streets. And you'd hear wailing and screaming throughout the land there in Egypt. Verse 13 continues, Seeing the blood, I will pass over you. Thereby, when I strike the land of Egypt, no destructive blow will come upon you. So God speaking to Israelites, saying, I'm about to release an unstoppable force, the destroyer. And it's going to go through the streets of this greatest military, economic powerhouse up into the time in Egypt. And it's going to go through and make its way, and it's unstoppable. Nothing's going to stop it, except for one thing. The only thing that will protect you of this unstoppable force is a lamb. It's like, wait, what, a lamb? A lamb's going to stop the thing that's going to go through and make its way through the, the military powerhouse of the world, Egypt? Yes, that's the only thing that will face the destroyer, this judgment is to kill a lamb, eat the lamb, and place the blood on its door. The slayed lamb was the substitutionary sacrifice. Every house in Egypt that night either had a dead son or a dead lamb. Said another way, every firstborn son, every firstborn son of the Israelites would look at the table, if they were still alive, would look at the table and say, I'm still alive because this thing is dead. The power of the lamb. 
The power of the Lamb is also highlighted in verse 22, again, which we don't hear, hear in our first reading here, but verse 22, God says to the Israelites, after you put the blood on your door, not one of you should go out of your house until morning. He's saying this to the Israelites. So what's being said here is the destroyer, God's judgment, is not coming just for the Egyptians. The Israelites too. It's like, wait, what? Like, the Israelites have got to be saying, like, we're the oppressed ones here. The Egyptians, they're the ones that are oppressing us. The Egyptians, they worship false gods. We worship the one true God. Why would, why would the destroyer, the judgment, be coming after us? Why wouldn't we be safe? God is saying this. He's saying this to the Israelites. If you were to go out tonight on your own, under your own accord, being an Israelite would not be enough to help you. Even being morally ethical, being a good Israelite, following the Ten Commandments would not be enough to, to save you. You would still die. None of that would help you. You would be lost, you would be as lost and as powerless as the Egyptians are. So God is saying this. God is saying, even though I'm delivering you tonight, rescuing you from the hands of your oppressors, as important as this deliverance is, you still need another deliverer. You have a bigger problem than just, to sla just the slavery under Pharaoh. The bigger problem is sin. You need another deliverance. That's the key here. Even the Israelites, you need another deliverance. This time, deliverance not from the power of the tyrant of Pharaoh and being enslaved to him, but this time under the slavery of sin. In other words, you need another lamb. And so hence, our gospel today. The old Passover, which our first reading prefigures here what we commemorate here in the new Passover. The Last Supper, Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, he gathers together to celebrate the Passover, as any good Jew would. And so there's the bread, there's the wine, the lamb. There's mention of the bread, there's mention of the wine, but there's no mention of the lamb. You can't have a Passover meal without the lamb. The lamb, the blood of the lamb, is the thing that saved us. That's, the, that's why we gather to remember of us being delivered from the hands of Pharaoh and the slavery. So where's the lamb? When Jesus offered on that night of the Last Supper, instead of a lamb, Jesus gave himself, his body and his blood. And when Jesus offered his body and blood to his disciples that night, the Old Testament then is when it gets its true meaning. Everything in the Old Testament comes alive at this point. It all begins to make sense. If you remember, all the way back in Genesis chapter two, 22, there's a, there's a theme of the story of the Lamb throughout the scriptures. Genesis chapter 22, remember Adam, Abraham hears God say to him, offer up your only son as a sacrifice to me, right? To test Abraham. And as they're climbing up Mount Moriah, what do we hear little Isaac say to his dad? Hey, Dad, I see the wood. We've got the, the, we've got the wood for the fire. We've got the knife. Where's the lamb, Dad? Where's the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham looks at his son and says, God will provide the lamb, my son. Hoping that, that God would provide, that he wouldn't have to kill his son Isaac. And of course, foreshadowing the lamb to be slain, the sacrifice for all of Jesus Christ. And also the full meaning of the Passover. We get the full meaning of the Passover. When the destroyer came, it's not that the sacrifice and the blood of a silly lamb delivered and saved the Israelites. It's that God would later provide the lamb, his son, as a sacrifice. And of course, skipping ahead to the Gospel of John, we remember John the Baptist in chapter 3, 
When he sees Jesus, he cries out. And this bizarre statement, as he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, Behold the Lamb of God. When he sees Jesus, connects with him and saying, That's the one. That's the one. That's the Lamb. That's the reason why the firstborns, our firstborns back thousands of years ago, didn't have to die. He's the one to be sacrificed. His blood is the ultimate deliverance, not from slavery of Pharaoh, but of sin and death. And just as the Israelites were not saved that night on their own accord, if they followed the Ten Commandments, they were ethically superb and morally right all regards. If they went outside, it wouldn't be enough to save them. Same is the case for us. We're not saved any other way except for the blood that was shed from the cross. All the sin offerings in the entire Old Testament couldn't satisfy, doesn't satisfy. No blood, of course, from an animal satisfies the debt that's paid, the, be- the debt that's need to be paid. It's the sacrifice of the lamb that finally atones for our sins and to reconcile us. That's the power of the lamb. Which brings us to the memorial sacrifice. Our preface today, every, every Eucharist has a preface. That most masses has a unique preface, and especially at this mass, there's a unique preface, and the preface reads this. For he is the true and eternal priest who instituted the pattern of an everlasting sacrifice and was the first to offer himself as the saving victim, commanding us to make this offering as his memorial. The Eucharist, the Mass, presents to the Father the sacrifice that was accomplished on Calvary. And it's offered again and again and again at this altar and at every altar around the world when Mass is celebrated. The great and perfect sacrifice that atoned for our sins 2,000 years ago of Jesus on the cross that reconciled us to the Father is made present over and over and over again at this altar. Jesus is both the priest and the victim. That is to say, Jesus as the priest, the priest, what does the priest do? The priest is the one who offers the sacrifice. Jesus is both the priest and the victim. That is to say, he's the one to be sacrificed as well as the priest, and is present sacramentally here through the priest. That is to say this, that when the priest stands at the altar, or in other words, when I stand at this altar here in a matter of a few moments, and I bow and I say, this is my body, it is Jesus Christ who's speaking these words through the priest speaking through me, the words of Jesus. Now, there's nobody that that's more mind-blowing for than the priest. I assure you. I was recalling to one of the deacons the other day, the Lord just graced me with this on-the-spot reminder of when I was ordained a priest now, close or three and a half years ago. After or during the rite of ordination, after I was ordained a priest as a part of ordination that's uh, just called an exchange of peace, where all the brother priests now come and they exchange a sign of peace with the priest that was just ordained. And I'm kind of cool, I'm collective up until this point. Like, yeah, I got this, I'm a priest now. Whatever that, however I can comprehend that. And then a priest coming up from the seminary who I have a lot of respect for, who's helped, who helped me through a number of challenging moments when I was in the seminary. When he got up to me, he just grabbed my hands and he took my hands and he brought them up to him and he kissed them. And at that moment, I just lost it. On the spot there with my family right, be- right behind me and I don't like to cry in front of my family. I don't like to cry in front of anybody, let alone, my, let alone my family. And I'm just up there sobbing as this priest just kissed my hands. The dignity of the priesthood hit me at that moment. 
it pierced my heart of what the priesthood is, the reality of who I am, that I'm conformed to the person of Jesus Christ by, by the virtue of my ordination. Yes, was he kissing Mark Bernhard's hands? Yes, he was. But he was also kissing the hands of the person of Jesus Christ. I should live differently because of that. I'm called to. On this day, typically, the Chrism Mass is celebrated either today or on our diocese on Monday. At the Chrism Mass, the priest recalls those, that day of which he was consecrated to conform his life to Christ. For everyone, for you, the priest to offer himself as a sacrifice, the priest to offer this sacrifice for you and for the salvation of the world. All priests should live differently because of this. They're called to. This reality makes it all the more scandalous when priests falls beneath their dignity. And we've seen a lot of that. And the, the church suffers when that happens. And when the church suffers, the world suffers. So pray for us. Because we were not ordained to live comfortable lives, but to sacrifice and to serve you, to offer sacrifice for you. That's the role of the priest. And to lead you to him at all costs, we're to lead you to him. To make him present for you here at this altar. To be always kept in the tabernacles throughout the world for you to come and to spend time with him, before him. Jesus instituted the priesthood on this night so as to give himself to us continually. With that, a suggestion. In a minute, we're going to sing Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. A few moments after that, I'm going to elevate the broken host and proclaim, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Perhaps we've sung those words hundreds, if not thousands of times throughout our lives. Or we've heard the priest say that hundreds of times. Make tonight different. Because there's truly power in the Lamb. May we behold the Lamb of God different tonight. And may we, may we respond by offering our lives on this altar. To the one who gave us his life.